Uh, good morning, sir. Can you hear, uh, see and hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you. May uh, the witness, John Simpkins, be sworn, please? Yes, of course. I do solemnly. I do solemnly. Sincerely and truly. Sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Simpkins. My name is Jason Beer, and I ask questions on behalf of the inquiry. In front of you, there should be um, a witness statement in your name. Yes. Uh, can you turn, please, to the last page of it? It's 18 pages in length, dated the 4th of August, 2022. And for the transcript, the reference is WITN 04110100. On page 18, is that your signature? Page 19, yes. It's page 19, is it? You're quite right. Uh, are the contents of it true to the best of your knowledge and belief? They are. A copy of that will be uploaded to the inquiry's website. I'm not going to ask you about every part of it, just selected parts. Do you understand? I do. Can you tell us your qualifications, please? Um, I studied software engineering at uh, University of Birmingham. Um, I am a member of the British Computer Society, a uh, chartered IT professional, uh, and an incorporated engineer. Uh, you joined Pathway, um, ICL Pathway Limited in 1996, July 1996, is that right? Yes. Um, as an application uh, developer, is that right? Correct. Can we look at paragraph 9 of your witness statement, please, uh, which is page 3? Just wait a moment, it'll come up on the screen. You say um, in paragraph nine, while I was initially taken on as an application developer, I only remained in this role for a very short period of time and did not in fact develop any aspects of the Horizon system myself. During my time as an application developer, I worked with Di Jones to learn the coding language being used um, at the time. Uh, when you were um, working with uh, Di Jones, but was there any discussion about the coding, the quality of the coding language being used at the time? No, I was really only training at that time. So I was being taught how to interact with the repos system. Uh, did um, Di Jones ever discuss with you the quality of the coding on the Isha product known as repost? Um, not at that time. Uh, um, I said at any time. Yeah. Um, not unless there was a pen record that was raised on it. I'm sorry? Not unless there was any um, calls raised on the code. Can you recall whether there were? There, there were many calls raised on the code over the years. I don't know if Di Jones raised any of those calls. Uh, can you remember any wider discussion with Di Jones about the quality of the coding on the Isha product repost? No, I don't. You don't? I don't recall any further conversations with Di Jones. I was only worked with him for a very short amount of time. After that initial uh, period of training as an application developer, when you worked with Di Jones, did you have cause to work with him again? No. You say the language was known as Visual Basic. A key role of the development team was to ensure that the Visual Basic coding being used by the team interfaced properly with Isha's software product, Repost. Uh, did it interface properly with Isha's product, Repost? Um, yes, that was the way it was. That was the way we interfaced with that product. That was. So I know it was the way I was asking. Did it interface properly? Um, yes. There were no problems with it at all. With Vis um, with Repost um, or Visual Basic or the interaction, there was. Um, it, I don't recall any problems with the Visual Basic and the interaction with the the DLLs between Visual Basic and the repost application. And then over the page, you say access to the Isha source code was only granted to the development team if absolutely necessary. Uh, so to your understanding, um, it wasn't a question of intellectual property rights preventing any access to the Isha source code, source code is that right? I believe so. I think we had a copy of the source code on the sixth floor in a safe in case it was ever required 
but I don't recall it ever being used. You say that access was only granted if absolutely necessary. Uh, was it um, necessary? Um, I don't recall it ever being But that facility was there? That facility was there, um, yes. It wasn't that you could never have access to it? Um, I believe it, the reason it was there was so that people could have access to it. Yes, thank you. You then moved into the Software Support Centre. Um, is that called the SSC? Correct. It was initially the System Support Centre, and then I think. I was about to ask it, the, the um, term Software Support Centre and SSC is that used um, interchangeably sometimes with System Support Centre? It is. Um, I believe originally it was System Support Centre up until after Mick left, and I think it got changed to Software Support Centre after that time. And you've remained, I think, in the SSC for 26 years now. You're currently a team leader in the SSC. That's correct. Before you became a team leader in the SSC, um, I think that was in 2010, um, what was your job title? Uh, project specialist. And was that the same for the previous 14 years? Yes, I think everyone had that title, really. And what was the role of a project specialist? Um, it was to receive uh, tickets or um, could we sometimes had direct email um, and we would investigate problems on the live system um, and then potentially reports as well to service management. Um, we try and produce workarounds if there was an issue um, and um, try and resolve problems that were passed to us really on the live estate. And was there a level below a project specialist in the SSC? N not by terminology. Um, you had areas of specialism. Um, so there were many products that made up the solution, um, like the databases and repass the agents. And, um, and people were specialists in certain areas. Um, but I think they were all called project specialists. You might be working on typically the rollout database, um, ACMS, or any of these other areas, um, but um, you, you were still, I think, called a project specialist. In, say, 99-2000, at the rollout stage of um, Horizon, um, how many people worked in the SSC? I think we went up to about 25. And at, say, 2010, at rollout stage of Horizon Online, uh, how many uh, people worked Probably in the SSC? Probably slightly more. I, mean, I think Nick was hiring at that time. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think it probably topped out around 30, but maybe maybe around 25 to 30. <coughs> how many team leaders were there in the SSC, say, at the, the first date that I mentioned, 99, 2000? There was only a manager at that point, no team leaders. Uh, when were team leaders introduced? 2010. So when you became one? Yeah, so um, after Mick left 20, 2009, I think we had Tony Little step in for a while, and then Steve then took over at 2010, and he introduced the three team leaders. Uh, the, the Steve you refer to there, is that Steve Parker? That's correct. Um, who did each of the um, SSC team leaders report to? To him? To him, yeah. And he was the SSC manager, is that correct. right? And do you know to whom he reported? Um, not at that time. I mean, Steve Macau, I'm not sure when Steve Macau left. Um, Peter Burden, not sure when Peter Burden left. They were levels above him. Um, not sure, I'm afraid. Okay. Uh, can we look at paragraph seven of your witness statement, please? Um, which is at the foot of page two. You um, say in the second sentence, <coughs> the team, that's the SSC, does not support the hardware or operating systems. Um, the team had a good interaction with the testing teams and development to supply evidence and find possible ways to recreate defects on the test equipment. We also interacted with sub-postmasters when gathering or providing support. The SSC was not responsible 
for reporting to um, post office. Who was responsible for reporting to post office? Um, I know that um, Mick did do monthly reports. And Mick? So Mick Peach yep. um, did monthly reports um, up to his management. Um, there was also service management. Sorry, just stopping there. Sorry. You say that um, he, Mick, did reports up to his management. Yeah. Was that still within Fujitsu or ICL? Within Fujitsu. He also... Um, I'm not sure of the date totally. He introduced something called the SMP Service Management Portal, which he... Can you explain what the SMP was? So it was a website um, that Mick introduced and wrote, and it was for him to put reports on. And I believe the um, change management OCPs were also copied onto there, and that was for um, post office to have visibility of these. Did post office have direct access to the yes. SMP? Uh, you were about in your first answer to go on to um, speak about the service management team. So, yes, yeah, service management um, was really <clears throat> the interface, I believe, between um, support issues and post office. And just stopping you there, where were they based? The they were in um, the Fujitsu. I think they were in Bracknell as well. Um, and then I was going to talk about the MSU, the Management Support Unit. Um, they did the reconciliation and they reported... The reconciliation the, of what? Sorry, um, if there were any reconciliation incidents. Um, so they would then report those reconciliation incidents back to the post office. Um, the term I re remember currently is BIMS, um, Business Incident Management. Um, um, but there is also, um, reading through the pinnacles, some red, but I don't know what red represented. You say in um, uh, paragraph 25 of your witness statement, to the extent that there were any known defects when releases were rolled out, my understanding is that this would have been communicated to the post office, either by the service management team or by other ICL teams. I was not involved in communications with post office in this regard. Neither am I aware of how uh, or if such issues were communicated to sub-postmasters. And later in your statement in paragraph 47, in relation to the accuracy and integrity of data recorded and processed on the system, you say, I can't comment on how general issues would be relayed to post office. But in respect of individual incidents, I believe this information was passed back to the post office through the BSU stroke MSU or service management. Um, what's the basis for those understandings and beliefs that you give? So the first one was about projects. So when we have new um, functionality entered into the system, it's normally entered in via project. It's not normal support at that stage. And projects have a projects are managed so, um, and I believe they are fed back through the project management chain. That's it's, yes, and what was your belief for that? Uh, what was the basis for that belief? I have been involved in some projects. Um, I'm really. talking about this one. So it's paragraph 25. Yeah, I'm just reading. When known defects when the releases were rolled out, your understanding that this would have been communicated to the post office. And I'm asking you for the basis for that belief, please. Just because projects reported back. Sorry, I've got nothing more than that. So it's a general understanding that that's what should happen yes. between a, um, a, a service provider, Fujitsu, and its client, the post office. Correct. You haven't got any actual knowledge of whether that did happen. I've got no actual knowledge. You see, we, we've heard some evidence um, in the inquiry that because this was a PFI, Public Finance Initiative, um, framework under which the services were being provided, um, the post office had what was described as limited or partial visibility of um, the design approach, the development approach, and defects. Were you aware of that or not? Not particularly, no. And in relation to the comment in paragraph 47, um, 
where you say, I believe that information, that's general issues, um, sorry, uh, uh, specific individual incidents, you believe that information was passed back through the BSU stroke MSU or service management. Again, what's the belief for that, or the basis for that belief and understanding? So if there was a um, issue that was a new issue, that would be put into the monthly reporting by the SSC manager and um, service management were involved in resolution of issues. Um, with the, they, they were the ones who did the reporting. Um, the issue is if it's a reconciliation incident, they would do the reporting. Do you know, um, from personal knowledge, the extent of the reporting by MSU, BSU? I'm sure in the court case there was a month, there was a released a monthly service management report. Um, I can't remember which incident it was referred to, but it had broken down about recent issues. So the, the court case you're referring to is? The GLA, sorry. Um, and what's your basis for, um, what's your knowledge of the GLO that you're referring to there? Um, Are you referring I, to the judgment or? Um, there was some evidence um, released as part of the GLO and that included a um, monthly um, report from the, the Fujitsu service management team. And so the evidence, whose evidence are you referring to? I'm, I couldn't tell you whose evidence. So I'm just trying to explore where you're getting this knowledge from. Is it as a result I, I of receipt? The, yeah, I, I viewed this document that was part of the released um, documents part of the GLA. So I'm just going to press you a little further. Sure. You, you viewed a document that was included as evidence in the GLO? That was released. Um, I was following the GLO um, case and one of the documents in there was that, um, as, that was released as part of the evidence was a service management report. And how are you following the GLO? We followed the Twitter feed and also um, there were some solicitors. Um, we provided um, some information to the solicitors. So the thing you're telling us about now is based on reading a tweet about a GL, the, GL, the conduct of the Seeing GLA. a document that was from that. And sorry, and seeing a document? So there was a document that was released as evidence, which was a service management monthly report from Fujitsu to post office. OK. Uh, can I move on to um, helpline systems, please? And as the first witness who's giving evidence to the inquiry about support services available to sub-postmasters, um, I'd like to use you, please, just to confirm the various levels of ICL and Fujitsu support that were available. I think it's right that initially there were three levels of support and then that grew to four. Is that right? Yeah. Was the first line of support um, the sub-postmaster's initial point of contact? Yes. And um, essentially Fujitsu's gateway to the remainder of the for, uh, service yes. support? Um, was that carried out by the Horizon System Help Desk, which was later known as the Horizon Service Desk? Correct. And would this be a fair summary? It would seek to resolve basic queries and then pass on those that it couldn't rectify to the second line of support? Yes. Um, initially, did um, the Horizon System Help Desk people work in Feltham? Yes. And was that uh, where you worked? Yes. As part of the SSC? Yeah, Feltham 01. I'm sorry? Fel 01, Feltham 01. There's multiple Fujitsu buildings in Feltham. I think you say in your statement that it was in fact in the same room as you, is that right? That's right. So there was a custom built room for IGL um, which brought the parties together. So in the same room we had the HSH, we had us, the SSC, EDSC. We had the operations team and we had our gyro bank. And um, how many of them were there, say, at 2009, 2000? Just a couple. Uh -huh. Just two people? Uh, right at the beginning, yeah. 2000, two, um, 1997, uh, 1996 to 1997, only, only a couple, of very, very limited. When we moved into Bracknell and they moved out, 
I don't know how many there were then. Um, did, did they move to Bracknell? Sorry, they, they moved to Stevenage. Um, wasn't that the second line of support that moved to Stevenage? The second line were also in Stevenage. Okay. So um, just to make it clear, um, first line of support also moved to Stevenage. Correct. That, okay. And when was that? I'm presuming it was when we also moved out in uh, 97, but I would have to ask and check. The second line of um, support for software, um, was that provided by the System Management Centre, or SMC? Correct. And would this be a, um, a reasonable description of it? It sought to resolve technical problems itself and acted as a gatekeeper and filter to the third line of support? Yes. Uh, it was also <coughs> excuse me, involved in identifying system events that could indicate a software problem had arisen? Yes. Um, there was also, is this right, uh, another second line of support uh, for hardware as opposed to software? Um, yes. Um, the engineers, I wasn't very much involved in the engineering. Oh, unless you're talking about the ops team. No, hardware be the engineering. Um, they initially worked in Feltham, is that right? The um, system management centre. I don't think they were in place when we were in Felton. Okay, so what they only ever existed in Stevenage? Correct. Uh, third line of support, um, I think, is this right, provided by a variety of teams depending on the issue. The first of them was uh, you, um, the System uh, uh, Service Centre or SSC. And that had as its focus investigation and rectification of software problems. Correct. There was the management support team or, um, or management support unit, MSU, uh, that monitored and managed reconciliation errors. Yes. Uh, a reference data team, were you aware of um, them? I was. Um, they eventually joined into the SSC. Did they focus on errors um, or problems in or with the reference data upon which Horizon re relied? Yes. And then Operational um, Services Division, which I think you've called Operations, yes. um, they provided um, support to network and central system incidents? Yes, yes, they looked after data centres, yes. <coughs> and then the fourth line of support involved development teams that would make changes to Horizon coding um, to resolve identified errors, bugs and defects. Would that be right? Yeah. Would you agree that um, your part of um, the third line of support, its intended purpose and functions were to resolve or to provide a support service to resolve technical problems in the minimum time possible and the minimum disruption to the service and to the network? Uh, yes. Um, when you say network, you don't mean physical network, you mean as in... The, the system. Yeah. Uh, to provide a centre of technical expertise for customer services more generally, providing technical advice, guidance and expertise and to maintain the KEL database? Yes, we, we ran the KEL database. Would you agree that the SSC was at the heart of the support services provided for Horizon? The software support services, yes. And in particular, it occupied a central position in the investigation of bugs, errors and defects? Yes. If you look at page 19 of your witness statement, at paragraph 17 of your witness statement, on page 7, about six lines in, you say, if first line support could not resolve the issue and it was related to the software, it would be escalated to the second line support team. Do you see that sentence? 
Yes. Can you assist us? How would somebody in the first line of support on the end of a phone know that an issue that was being reported to them by a sub-postmaster was or was not related to software? Um, I didn't work in the HSH, but I believe they had scripts to follow, which would help them. So a postmaster phones up and says, there is, uh, I've got this issue, there's a reconciliation problem. How would the first line support know that that related to software? As I say, I did not do their role. However, I do believe they had scripts to follow in which they would ask them to check various things throughout the script. And I'm going to press you a little further because of what you said in your statement. Yeah. Um, having gone through the script, how would the first line support know that the issue related to software and therefore pass it to the second line? I presume that they get to the end of the script, it hasn't resolved the issue, and then they would pass to their second line team. So it must relate to the software? It must not always relate to the software, but, um, because the script will only test so many things. What also, training did the first line support have to make decisions about whether an issue related to software or did not? I couldn't tell you what the training of the first line was. Were, to your knowledge, sub-postmasters told that there were three and then four possible lines of support? I don't know what the sub-postmasters were told about the support hierarchy. So you don't know what they knew? I don't know what the sub-postmasters knew. I know that um, um, quite often one of them would talk to us but they were, I think if they knew that what role we were providing, I think they would ask for people by name. The sub-postmasters would? Yeah, there's definitely um, some pinnacles where a sub-postmaster who's been talking to someone in the third line support would ask, could they talk to that person again? Yeah, so they've had some dealings with them. They would say, can I speak to John again, please? Exactly. But they wouldn't know when they're phoning up. I've got a problem with software. I need to speak to John. No, no, I don't. What, um, with what frequency would software issues, uh, to your knowledge, be referred to uh, second line support? I couldn't tell you, but I'm sure from the power help tickets you could work it out um, because they've got the team transfers in the um, power help. Um, I could tell you that about 2% of calls came from PowerHelp to Pinnacle, and about half of those were raised by sub-postmasters, so about 1% of calls were raised by sub-postmasters to the SSC. And, and the other 1%? You, the other one was the issue, reconciliation, and, sorry, um, issues passed in from other teams, not necessarily um, the sub-postmasters, but... Uh, SMC or BSU. Uh, why would the teams um, split up? Um, why were the HSH and SMC split up? Or Yes. I, I presume that the SMC... D don't worry about presumptions or speculation. Sorry. Do you know? I don't know. Um, if well, you don't know an, an answer to a question, it's best to say it okay. um, rather than put together maybe fragments of evidence and, and to speculate. Okay. Were you party to any discussion over whether the support team should remain together rather than splitting up into different offices? No. Was there, um, within third-line support, ever discussion over trends or patterns that emerged from the nature of calls that were being received? For example, a theme is emerging that there are constant problems with balancing. Um, definitely would look at trends and investigate things. If you never got quite to the bottom of something, you saw something again, you would continue. You would normally raise a cow on a topic and then you would say on there, you know, if this happens again, could you please examine this and this. Sometimes evidence was too old by the time we got there. Um, what do you mean by that? Sometimes, sometimes evidence, evidence has been archived away. 
archived by who? By the post. And um, what difficulty did that present? Um, it meant that you could sometimes not get to the bottom of an issue. So you would raise a cow, and if it occurs again, then you know where to look at straight away. But when you say it had been archived away by riposte, was that a function of riposte that could not be um, broken into or interfered with? Archiving definitely could be changed, yes. And it actually, there were features to turn archiving off if, for example, the system had been off for a long time, um, but yes, archiving could be changed. Um, th that, that's a, a separate issue whether archiving could be changed. In respect of data that had been archived, was it impossible to look at it? Um, it wasn't impossible because it would have gone to audit. Um, but yes, so you could have gotten information from audit. You said that it was um, difficult sometimes because Ripost had archived the material. Did you ever, or were you ever a part of, a process to obtain material from archive in order properly to investigate an issue? We've definitely made a request to the archive team, yes. And so that was a theoretical difficulty rather than an actual one, would that be right? Yes, so I was trying to come up with reasons why you may not have got to the bottom of a problem. Yes. And why were you trying to come up with reasons why you might not have got to a, the bottom of a problem? Because you were asking about how you may the process for going around um, to documenting um, a trend. Yes. And so this is a theoretical obstacle that could be overcome. That one was. If you wanted to get to the bottom. Yes. And what other obstacles would there be in getting to the bottom of a problem? Um... Yeah, I'm going to have to look at some pin uh, pinnacles or cows and come back. I'm sorry? I would look at some pinnacles and cows and come back to you about reasons why we may have raised some to a trend analysis, if that's OK. Uh, d does it follow from the, the need to um, carefully think about it? That there's nothing obvious that strikes there's you? There's nothing obvious. Yeah. That prevents prevent it, other than the very theoretical thing that you've mentioned, in getting to the bottom of a problem? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Beer, could this statement be taken down from my screen? No. Oh, I'm so sorry, sir. Yes, of course. Okay. Was the main mechanism for picking up themes the use of the Kell system? Um, not particularly. The Kell system was very useful for SMC with eventing. Um, it was useful to see if this issue had occurred before, but generally, if things occurred before, we you tended to know them. Um, so it was a way of, say, um, providing advice and guidance on how to deal with something, um, mainly if you've not seen it very often. What was the mechanism, if any? for picking up themes and trends then, if it wasn't the Kell system? Um, the Kell system was good because, so if, if we had a lot of incidents with the same um, issues, then if they were actually found to be defects and passed on to full flying, there would be trends in that because of the number of pinnacles raised and applied to the same products um, that you can see in the pinnacles. Um, if the, the, um, the Kell system was good for identifying if something 
had occurred before as well. We did sometimes add onto it, could you add other pinnacle references if this reoccurs? So there was trend in, in the CAL system as well. Was there any other system operated, to your knowledge, to pick up um, themes and trends in the problems with the system that were being reported to Fujitsu? Not in the SSC. Um, in any other part of the um, service help yeah. levels of support, to your knowledge? Um, there were other teams like QFP and... What does QFP sorry, stand quality for? filtering process that would uh, manage incidents um, to the... Develop. So when we pass a ticket in Pinnacle to the full-flying people, it will often go through the quality filtering process team who decide where it was to go to, which area of expertise inside the full-flying support teams. And so <coughs> there was also analysis of um, when ticket working out the amount of effort a fix may take, that that was all in part of the um, development and release process. That sounds like it's more about um, systems control within Fujitsu for the benefit of, of the um, efficient operation of the help service within Fujitsu. Yeah. I'm talking about something that's of benefit perhaps to the post office or to sub-postmasters, i.e. something within Fujitsu where um, repeated um, errors, bugs or defects, or even um, repeated calls about the same system at the issue, for example, balancing, were picked up to say, look, we've got a trend developing here, we need to undertake a root cause analysis or something like that. There is nothing automated that I know of. What about people? Yeah, I mean, there were people in the support teams. Uh, which uh, part of the support teams? Sorry. There was nothing in the SSC that I know of that was Had that dedicated to do that function. Um, there was customer service and service management teams but At what level of the four were they? They weren't support teams, sorry. They were the people that I said would report um, to post office the um, major incidents and things like that. And how would they get to know about any trends or themes that were developing? Um, only if they would be reported up. So by? By, by I would say, the help desk or the SMC or us, the SSC. And did you management. do that? Did you um, take a step back rather than dealing with the next ticket on the on the line? Did anyone in your team take a step back and say, there's a theme developing here, there's an underlying issue, we need to make a reference? I can't give you any examples of that. Can I turn to the repost product, please? Um, at page 15, paragraph 48 of your statement... At the foot of the page, you say, in terms of deficiencies during this time, there were a number of difficulties arising from the repost product. These included malformed messages and replication issues. What was... Um, what were the difficulties arising from the repost product? So the malformed messages is when a message is missing attributes. Um, so Mr. Cipriani wrote down what a message attribute, a message, repost message looks like. Yes. And it's um, got different attributes in it. Um, and we used to use a system called a tip repair tool when these messages were harvested into the, the um, TPS system um, and some of these attributes were missing. Um, then we would have to 
um, go and look and see where what was happening on the counter when that um, message was written to identify what the missing attributes were. What was the cause of the malformed messages? I don't know what the underlying root cause of that problem was. Was that ever investigated? I'm sure it was. By who? Being fourth line support talking to Escher. Uh, was um, the cause of the difficulties the coding? I don't know what the root cause was. Were you ever told back back down the line Sometimes what, the, what the root cause was? If you um, had a uh, ticket and it was being investigated by um, fourth line support, you would hold on to the ticket to find out what the root cause was. Uh, you tell us in your statement that um, malformed messages could potentially result in a receipts and payments mismatch. Um, but this would unlikely uh, have caused a discrepancy, i.e. a loss or a gain. Um, how would a receipt to mismatch problem or issue manifest itself to the sub-postmaster? They were informed by a message saying that there had been a receipt to payments mismatch and it would be um, when they produced the cash account, the final cash account, I believe. And how would the malformed message sometimes cause the discrepancy then? The, the discrep it could affect the primary mappings, so the, sorry, the primary primary mappings. Sorry, can you explain what that is, please? So each transaction is um, added into the cash account using primary mappings. It's like a tree, and it builds up and searches for all those transactions that meet meet that primary mapping, and they're added together to um, complete that node, and it's all added up together. Um, and if that primary mapping was missing um, or malformed, then it wouldn't get put into the right place and as, it, as it builds up the cash account. To your knowledge, um, was the root cause of those problems fixed? Um, I don't know. Do you know what sub-postmasters were told when it was suspected that um, there was a, um, the, uh, a discrepancy caused by a malformed message. They would have had a message on screen saying there was a receipts and payments mismatch and then it would have um, been investigated. There was events written, I believe, as well. So, And also harvesting at the um, TPS database would identify it. So they, would, they could raise a call, but also we would get the... Um, ticket from the um, MSU VSU. I, I'm talking about what the sub-postmaster was told themselves. Look, there's a discrepancy. You've got this message. I don't um, know what... Maybe. Don't worry, it's not you. You haven't done anything wrong. It's We believe it's caused by a malformed message. I don't know what the sub-postmasters were told. You refer in paragraph 51 of your statement um, that to the fact that there could be many root causes for replication failures between counters. This could include network cable faults, hub faults for large branches, hardware faults, and issues with um, uh, repost. Can you exp expand on um, which of those um, potential faults were, in your experience, real faults that actually happened in practice? I think they all happened in practice. And again, to your knowledge, what were sub-postmasters told about this? They get the message that you've spoken about saying that there is a discrepancy, a mismatch. <coughs> what were they told about the cause of the mismatch if it was attributable to uh, uh, one of these things? The replication is different to the uh, corrupt... Um, the malformed message, yeah. Yeah. Um, but the replication would normally um, be presented to postmasters when they were looking um, at a transaction or, and then it's not there, so run a report and it's missing some transactions because they did them on counter two and they run a report on counter one. And again, can you help us with what they were told about those? Again, no, I can't tell. And is that because it was somebody else's responsibility to tell them? It would have come in from the um, HSH. 
you said it would have come in from the when they When they con contact the HSH to report the issue. But th they don't know, the sub-postmaster, whether this was a hardware fault. Uh, they don't know whether it's an issue with repost. They don't know whether any of the range of things that you mentioned so is, a, is a cause of the replication error. All they know is the error that message that they're getting. So what process was there to feed back to them? Look, you haven't done anything wrong. You haven't stolen thousands of pounds here. It's a problem with our system. So if, the rep if it was the repost one, then it wrote an event, which was picked up by the SMC, and they raised a call, and they, uh, they were contacted. Um, they contacted the software masters for those. If it was the hardware ones, I, I don't know. But, but again, that wouldn't have caused the receipts and payments mismatch. Sorry? Again, it was about replication, not corrupted nodes yes for the sub postmaster it may not matter particularly other than to know that it wasn't an error of their own yes but you can't help us as to um who was responsible for feeding that back to sub postmasters i can't no thank you in paragraph 58 of your statement You say, um, I'm not aware of any practices or procedures that may have been in place to obtain input from feedback from sub-postmasters during the pilot and rollout of Horizon. Is that because this was a different area of business from you, or is it because... It didn't happen. <laughs> I, I couldn't tell you because it was a different area from me. If they contacted, if a ticket was raised and came to us, we would talk to the sub postmasters relating to that ticket. This is a slightly different issue. This is um, during pilot and rollout, whether any problems that were being experienced by sub postmasters, whether there was a mechanism to capture those and to incorporate any fixes to them in the system. You're not aware of any kind of that process? No, I'm not. Um, can I turn to a different issue um, then, please? For how long have you known Anne Chambers? Um, quite a long time. She joined the SSC. Um, I can't tell you how long, but it was, it was many years, more than 10 years. And what was her function in the SSC? Um, she was a project specialist. Um, she dealt with um, counters in particular. Uh, was she there from the start, from your recollection? Not from the start. She was there a long time. And how closely did you work with her? Very closely. Was your contact with her um, frequent then, on a daily basis? Yes. How close did you um, sit from her physically? Um a couple of desks away. It was a strange arrangement of desks. And what was her role and function when you worked alongside her? Uh, she was another uh, SSC product specialist. And you said, I think, specialised in the counters. Yeah, her um, area of expertise was in the counters. And just explain what specialism in the counters means. Um, so when a ticket comes into the SSC, we had a... Um, pre-scanner and the pre-scanner's role was to analyze the ticket check it had all the <coughs> information expected on it and then route it to a member of the team in the ssc based on their workload and their areas of expertise and as i say she worked on the counter tickets uh, did you become aware of her being asked to give evidence um in a court case yes we were um you say we were. Um, yes, this is a whole were um, okay. aware of this. Um, Can you remember when that was? I can't remember the exact date, but I do remember that Anne was unhappy to be asked. She was unhappy? Yeah. This was before um, she'd actually given evidence, Correct. is that right? Can you remember whether there was discussion before she gave um, evidence about her suitability as a witness or the appropriateness of a member of the SSE going along to give evidence? I don't know that, that conversation. 
was there a conversation uh, between you and Anne or you and other members of the SSC and Anne about um, the appropriateness or suitability of her going along to be a witness? Um, there was conversations about whether SSC people were the right people to be used. And what, um, um, why was there a question over whether SSC people were the right people to be used? I think we thought it was more because we were very technically specialists in that area um, and not expert witnesses we were very unhappy about that process was Anne at Chambers very unhappy about the process I believe she was did she say that to you um, I cannot recall the conversation but I believe she was after she gave evidence, was there any discussion about the um, appropriateness of her doing so or her suitability as a witness? I don't know if there was anything about her suitability, um, but I know that she fed back to the SSC manager that she didn't find it at all nice. And we, I do not believe that, I believe the SSC manager then pushed back to say it so that it never happened again the SSC manager that um, she spoke to was? Mick Peach. And you said that the SSC manager, uh, worse to the effect of ensured that it never happened again. Uh, who did um, Mick Peach take that up with, to your I knowledge? Don't. And what was the issue with her giving evidence then? What was the problem about it? Um, it we just weren't expert witnesses. It was, it did not feel Right. Do you know why she did it? I believe that she was manoeuvred into it. I don't know if she really wanted to do it. Uh, she had dealt with the case, I believe. Who was she manoeuvred by? I don't know. On what basis do you say that she was manoeuvred? I don't think she would have wanted to do it otherwise. Uh, who are the candidates for manoeuvring her into doing it? I don't know. Can you help us? I would talk to about the, sec the security teams, maybe, who, who would have interfaced with the, um, um, the request for that. I don't know. At what level was her unhappiness at being asked to give evidence and then, after she had done so, um, expressing her um, unhappiness about having done so? On a scale of... Yes, of m mildly um, fed up at the bottom end yeah, to no. incandescent with rage <laughs> at the top end, say. She, she was probably in the middle. She was really said how unpleasant it was and she did not want to do it again. Uh, for how long have you known uh, Gareth Jenkins? Uh, Gareth, I think, was there from the beginning. I, I uh, recall seeing him in Feltham, so it would have been from probably 96. And how closely did you work with Mr Jenkins? Uh, so we interfaced quite a bit about... He was the fourth line um, and so the development and architecture, um, and he was a specialist in the um, repost area. Um, so if we had some issues in that area, we would talk to him. Um, he was approachable. How frequent was your um, contact with him? Maybe monthly. And would that be face-to-face -face or um, via Normally email? emails or um, pinnacles. Did you have meetings with him? I've definitely been in meetings with him. I think one of my um, witness ones is a meeting with him. To your uh, knowledge, what was his um, function? He was either chief technical or he was one of the technical chief technical people, architects for the um, repost area and later on he was also in HNGX. 
were you aware of any discussion about the suitability uh, of him or the appropriateness of him as a witness to give evidence? Not until the GLO. And so after the event? Yes. Um, when you saw that issue emerge in the course of the group litigation? Yes. Was there any um, contemporaneous discussion um, that you're aware of as to the selection of an appropriate witness to give um, evidence, either in written form or orally, in criminal proceedings against sub-postmasters for theft or, or for false accounting? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, we're aware of uh, an article in Computer Weekly, a trade journal, um, uh, of the 11th of May 2009. Can you remember when you first became aware of that? In this, I think you mentioned it recently. That's the first you've known of the Computer Weekly article? 2009, when I've watched some previous articles in, on the online Computer Weekly about things. Does it follow that the Computer Weekly article of May 2009 wasn't discussed um, in the office at about the time that it came out? I don't recall that. When you say you don't recall it, that, that could mean that it may have happened, but you may have forgotten, or I don't recall it because it's likely that it didn't happen. I don't recall it. Um, it could have happened, um, but I do not recall a conversation about it. Can I um, turn to a separate issue, uh, please? The issue of um, uh, remote access. Uh, could we look, please, at, um, at poll 303-0029? It will come up on the screen for you. <laughs> Can we look at um, page four first, please? At the foot of the page. This is an email of May 2004, 13th of May 2014, rather, um, from um, Sean Hod Hodgkinson. If we just look at the bottom of the next page, please, to see who he was. A senior consultant in the audit advisory division of Deloitte. Yes? Yes. And then if we just go back to uh, where we were, please, the previous page. Thank you. You can see um, uh, that the email of the 13th of May 2014 is um, uh, to a range of people. You're not included on this chain, but as we'll see in a moment, you end up answering the questions in this chain, do you remember? I do from reading. Yes. And so I just want to see what the questions <coughs> were first. Um, and this is to a, a collection of people, um, I think, uh, substantially within the post office. Um, all following review of the technical design document in relation to the branch database, I had a couple of queries that I was hoping you may be able uh, to help with. If not, please could you direct me toward uh, somebody who may be able to uh, um, assist. One, balancing transactions. Um, section um, 5.6.2, do you know what that is of? No. Um, describes back-end database amendment process, which is included by design. And then um, he quotes from the document, inserting balancing transactions. There is a requirement that the SSC will have um, ability to insert balancing transactions into the persistent objects of the branch database. There are reasons for SSC having to do so, e.g. to rectify erroneous accounting data that may have been logged as a result of a bug in the counter at stroke BAL. Over the page, please. SSC will have privileges of only inserting balancing correcting transactions <coughs> to relevant tables in the database. SSC will not have any privileges to update or delete records in the database. Any um, rights by the SSC to BRDB, uh, BRDB? Branch database. Uh, must be audited. The mechanism for inserting a correction record must ensure that the auditing of that action performed must be atomic. 
Uh, what do you understand to that mean? So um, what do you understand that to mean? So atomic is um, a database terminology, so that you write all the transactions or they all roll back. You don't have partial transactions written. Uh, there also needs um, a level of obfuscation to ensure that the audit mechanism is robust. What do you understand that sentence to mean? I have no idea. Uh, the above mentioned requirements suggest that there is a need for, correct, for a correction tool to be delivered, which performs the correction, audits it, and saves both changes. A simple low-cost solution for the tool is to provide a Linux shell-based utility. Can you help us with what Linux was, please? It's um, an operating system that is used on, on the branch database. Uh, which calls a PL-SQL package. Can you explain what that is, please? Uh, Programming language SQL is a way of writing structured query language um, transactions to a, a SQL database, which the branch database is. The package will allow inserts um, to the following transactional tables in the branch database live schema with the exception of the message journal. All inserts will be audited in the table and then a reference is given. And then the question um, that Mr. Hodgkinson asked, from the above, we wish to clarify with evidence where possible, how does this process operate and who has the ability to perform this, e.g. poll and or uh, Fujitsu? And then secondly, what monitoring is performed um, over the table and then the reference is given. <coughs> and if we can go back, please, um, to page four. We can see Dave King's response. He was the senior technical security assurance manager. What, what um, part of um, the post office was that um, within, to your I knowledge? don't know. So this is still um, within the post office at the moment. And he says, I believe the only way we'll be able to resolve this is if you get confirmation from Fujitsu of whether this uh, has ever been done and what the process is. Poll have no direct access to the database. D does that um, uh, sentence in the brackets there uh, correspond with your understanding that Poll had no direct access to the database? Yes. Um, if corrections are needed, we, in inverted commas, insert a transaction to correct the situation following a reconciliation process rather than make direct changes to any transaction in the database. Um, and then raises an issue about a contact within Fujitsu. Can we go back to page one, please, of the email chain? And then if we go to the foot of the page, keep going, keep going. Thank you. Um, at the very foot of the page, we can see an email from you um, to James Davidson of the 15th of May, 2014. Who was James Davidson? Um, I don't know. Um, I was asked by um, someone to provide some technical input from a couple of questions, so I did. Uh, you say... Um, we did not discuss timescales, but I've just been asked by Leighton for some more details before a 10.30 meeting today. Who was Leighton? I can't remember, I'm afraid. At this stage, um, you're saying, um, I've just been asked by Leighton for some more details before a 10.30 meeting, and it's 10.24 when you're writing the email. Um, did you have sufficient time to prepare the answers? Um, or, or are you hinting that you hadn't? <laughs> I probably was hinting that I've been given a very tight deadline, so I have not researched this information as far as I probably could. Did you um, know what the answers that you were giving um, were going to be used for, i.e. No. the purpose to which they were going to be put? No, I was very surprised to read the data right. I'm sorry. I was very surprised to read the data right and then the, the references in there to this email. And why were you surprised of what became of the answers? Because I was just asked a couple of technical questions. I mean, I don't mind the answers being there, but 
no one told me where they were going to go. What, if anything, would you have done differently if you knew where the answers were going to go and what use was going to be made of them in the future? I would have missed the 1030 deadline. But what other research would you have undertaken? I would have talked to the um, database um, uh, the database architect. Who was that? Gareth, Jing, uh, Gareth C. Mungle. Say that again, please. Gareth C. Mungle. So if we um, look then, question one about the, and then there's a reference to the table, um, and then you've broken down the question, um, part one, how does this process operate and who has the ability to be able to perform this, e.g. poll and or um, uh, Fujitsu? What did you understand the question to mean? Um, it's talking about <coughs> the branch transaction correction utility. Um, and so I was trying to... This, I know it has been used once, so I was using that information to try and um, detail what was the process, how that time had come about. You answer it as follows. The normal support route is used to identify when a fix is required, either from a branch raise incident or estate monitors that, support, that, that alert support staff. A TFS incident would be raised with evidence. What does a TFS incident mean? So Trioli for service is the um, first line help desk used at this time. Who would raise that incident? Um, so that would be, um, it depends on where the issue was identified. It could have come from the branch, um, MSU. It could have come from a postmaster. Um, or from SMC, or from even post office. You say um, this would be transferred to the SSC as a peak because they support the applications. Who's the they in that sentence? SSC. Um, the SSC would investigate with evidence from the support branch database, then liaise um, with fourth line uh, development evidence and progress would be recorded on the peak. Fourth line development would generate the required scripts using a test system to make the correction. And MSC, what's an MSC? Managed service change. So it's part of the um, authorised changes to systems. Um, we used to have OCPs and then it became MSCs and now it's TFS now changes. And overall, what is that describing, an MSC or uh, previously? It, it, it's going to OS, describe OCB. what the change is, and it's going to go to people to be authorised. It's going to be, this goes to a distributed list who have to authorise it. So um, an MSC would be raised for permission to run the support tool on the live branch database. The SSC would run the script using the support tool against the live estate. So... Um, Overall, in this part of the answer, um, you're describing um, who has the ability to perform the function, um, and it's um, generated by either sub-postmasters um, through first-line support um, um, or, or uh, somebody within Fujitsu themselves. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's picked up by third-line support, and um, if it's necessary to run scripts using a test system, a request would be raised for permission to do so. Yes. Is that a fair summary? That's a fair summary. Um, the second part of the question that you've broken down, what monitoring is performed over the table? Can you uh, explain, first of all, what the question means? W what monitoring is performed over that table? Um, that table is the journal that this tool writes to. Um, so I'm presuming it was meaning how is that um, table populated and then does it go anywhere else, like audit or whatever. And you answer, the support tool is written to run under the SSC read-only role. What does that mean? Um, so the role that doesn't have permission to write to a database. 
and connects internally as the apps up role write permission. What does that part of the sentence mean? That's the um, database role that does have permission to write to the database. What does and connects internally mean? It means that we don't manually have to switch the role to apps up. The tool does it all internally. If we needed to switch role to apps up, we have to request that permission um, from the SecOps team and the SecOps team get the ops team to make the change um, and then we can then switch role to apps up. What was apps up? Apps up is the role that allows write to the data update and to the database. What does apps up refer to? Application support, I presume, but yes. But why would operational security um, ordinarily be required to be contacted to give permission to use apps up? So this was a security switch, um, a additional check to make sure that the reason we're requesting right update to the database is reasonable. But this allowed um, an automated um, access to the apps up role. Correct. So normally apps up would be, we would use apps up when there is no tool, tooling defined for it. It's um, for when there is no plan. This is a planned tool. This tool can do all the connections underlying. You say all changes are written to the audit logs. What do you mean by that answer? Um, I believe that the output from the tooling is written to a log and then that log, log is written to the audit database. You say the output from the support tool is captured and recorded on the peak. That's, yeah, we did that as well, but there's, that is a manual process. But you're saying that there's a footprint of the use of the tool um, written automatically to the audit log? Correct. Um, I can find just one recorded use of this tool, and then you set it out? Yeah. And then over the page, please. You say this indicates that this parameter has not been changed since created on the 5th of October 2009. Um, I think that was going from the, there is no update timestamp, but there is a creation timestamp. That was what I was going from there. What do you mean by this indicates that this parameter has not been changed? What are you referring to, he, the there parameter? There was a specific question about a database parameter, and that is the output of my query against that parameter, what are the fields on that database parameter. What are you saying by that sentence? Um, so I'm detailing the settings of that parameter and making an observation that I believe it hasn't been updated since creation. And you're saying it's only been used once? No, sorry, that is a separate query to the other. There was two queries, one was about the actual tooling and has it been used? And then there's another query about this parameter. Yes, if we just go back to the foot of the previous page. And up a little bit, it's the bullet pointed in bold. Can we see evidence to demonstrate that this parameter is currently set to true? But what does that question mean? I am um, unaware. I was looking at what the parameter is in that data. So that question is, sorry, there is a parameter in the database. It's in this table. Can you find out, is the value true? What does that mean, though? Um, I, how, how that parameter is used, I cannot tell you. Right, you, you just wanted, uh, you answered the... I answered the question, the absolute question, what is that parameter set to? Overall, um, do the answers mean that the only way that someone in the SSC could amend cash accounts was by using the process that you described? 
um, or were you saying that that's just um, one type of process for amending cash accounts? Um, overall, I was answering the question about the usage of that tool, which was a question I would say there is, there is the ability of direct access, but that is extremely difficult. Um, that is the reason why there is a tool for doing such and why there's many, many tables that are written to in the branch database, not just a central database table with the branch detail, the cash account details or the BTS details in this time. And you have to update all of the correct tables in the right order or atomically. And this is a tool that is designed for that. And the actually the fourth line team would devise the scripts to be executed to do it correctly. Would it be wrong to say that overall from this email, you were saying that cash accounts have been amended only once? Um, I think it is a fair statement because I think of how difficult to update a cash account, a branch trading statement in HNGX database is. And so that, that would be a fair statement. You were saying that cash accounts, to your knowledge, had only been amended um, the once, and that was referring to the entirety of the period of time that you'd worked in the SSC. We're talking about the branch database. Yep. We're talking about HNGX from 2010 to now. Yes. Yes. So that would be an appropriate moment for the, um, the morning break. Very well. Uh, can I just ask, Mr. Simpkins, so that I'm clear about this? So, in the last series of questions and answers um, from Mr. Beer and your answers, you are confining what you say to the time from the rollout of Horizon Online as opposed to Legacy Horizon. You're not saying anything about Legacy Horizon. Correct. That's this correct. was talking about the branch database, which is only used from... Yeah, fine. HNG. Yeah, I've got it. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Call him now, Mr. Beer. Yes, yeah, so, so hop past then, please, sir. Fine. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Can you see and hear me? Yes, I can, yeah. yeah thank you. Uh, Mr. Simpkins, um, just one question arising from the last answer you gave. Mm -hmm. You said to the chairman that your email should be read in the context of only referring to Horizon Online. Yes. And you said um, in relation to the branch database. What did you mean by reference to the branch database? The branch database is only used in Horizon Online. Um, it wasn't in existence. It didn't exist in Horizon Legacy. Um, and that was something maintained by Fujitsu. It wasn't it, in the branch. That's correct. So, so, yeah, the branch database is, is in the data center. Thank you. Uh, can we look, please, at poll 302, um, <coughs> uh, 9.750. Poll 302.9.750. you'll see that this is a draft um, Deloitte report of the 23rd of May um, at 2014. If we can skip to page three, please. And then just look at the first couple of paragraphs. Um, as outlined to us by the uh, Post Office Limited litigation team, uh, poll is responding to allegations from sub-postmasters that the Horizon IT system used to record transactions in <coughs> poll branches is defective and that the processes associated with it are inadequate, e.g. that it may be the source and or cause of branch losses. Poll is committed to ensuring and demonstrating that the current uh, Horizon system is robust and operates with integrity within, within an appropriate control frame, framework. Poll is confident that Horizon and its associated control activities deliver a robust processing environment through three mechanisms. Poll have designed features directly into Horizon 
to exert control. Poll operates IT management over Horizon, and Poll have implemented controls into and around the business processes, making use of Horizon. Collectively, these three approaches of inherent systems design, ongoing systems management, and business process control are designed to deliver a Horizon processing environment which operates with integrity. And then um, further down the page, please. <coughs> Deloitte has been appointed to consider whether this assurance work appropriately covers um, key issues relating to the integrity of the processing environment to extract from the assurance work an initial schedule of Horizon features and to raise suggestions for potential improvements in the assurance provision. And then it sets out um, how it's going to do its work. Were you aware that this process was being undertaken in 2014? No. Um, can we um, uh, look forwards, please, to page 38? And I've just shown you those um, initial parts of the document in order that you can understand what the Content. document is and the bit that we're going to look at, um, where it falls within it. As part of their assurance work, um, Deloitte produce an assurance schedule. And they say that they present below a schedule of the assurance work <coughs> and sources which we have identified which relate to certain groups of Horizon features. And they record an assessment of the level of comfort that Poll has over the relevant Horizon feature. Do you see? Yep. And then if we can scroll forwards um, to page 48, please. Uh, can you see um, under the area usage in the second box down um, branch ledger transactions are recorded accurately in the audit store as the assertion giving rise to process integrity. The description of the um, feature of processing integrity is said to be formalised change control approval and monitoring process over usage of uh, balancing transactions. The source of that is said to be an email communication from uh, you of the 15th of May 2014, that's the thing we looked at, and articulating uh, control design around this process. And the level of comfort that Poll are said to have had is partial. <coughs> and then the next row, um, the key assertion giving rise to processing integrity was branch ledger transactions are recorded accurately in the audit store. Uh, the description, audit trail monitoring, um, the usage of balanced transactions, and again, the same source of evidence. Um, did you um, know that your email was going to be used in this way? No. Uh, what, if anything, would you have done differently in terms of its construction and the contents of it if you had known that it was going to be used in this way? I think I said earlier I probably have had a talk to the database architect just to clarify that this is, this is my email answered these questions. But um, I was fairly happy with what I replied to for the two questions that I was asked. So it was, am I detecting this, that it was the narrowness of the answers that you gave? Yeah. I that if you'd it. known that they were going to be used for this purpose, you might have added more to them? Yes. I take it, therefore, that you didn't discuss with Deloitte the provision of your email or the content of the answer? Definitely not. <coughs> can we look, um, please, that can be taken down at poll... 302-8070. Uh, we're uh, um, three years on now, and another report, also in draft, from um, uh, <coughs> um, Deloitte. Um, if we uh, go... Again to page three, please. You will see um, a summary from uh, Deloitte 
of the Horizon Online system. It sets out the controls that respond to the fundamental risks under those subparagraphs. Can you recall um, this um, report being produced? No, I've seen it in my bundle, but I don't recall it being produced. Do you uh, recall whether um, they, that's Deloitte, uh, spoke uh, to you about it, the contents of the report? No. Can we just look forward, please, to um, page 83 of the document, please? In an appendix, they set out a list of um, individuals that they, Deloitte, say, were interviewed. And um, can you see your names, too, from the okay. bottom here? Uh, John Simpkins, an SSC team leader. Were you interviewed by Deloitte? I don't recall being interviewed by Deloitte, no. I think you probably remember if you were, wouldn't I, you? I would have thought so. So this um, is, is incorrect? They've also got John Hume as working for a post office. I'm so sorry. Sorry, the one above is incorrect as well. I.e. his employer or, or not Fujitsu, to be yeah. So in any event, so far as the contents of the um, October 17 um, Bramble report for Deloitte, um, you were not interviewed for that. I don't recall ever being interviewed for that. Can I... Um, that can be taken down, thank you. <coughs> can we look, please, um, at Fujitsu 3088-8036? And if that could just be expanded a little bit, please. Do you recognise this? Yes. Um, and what do you recognise it as? Um, it's a support... Well, it's a design document um, for when... We were introducing OpenSSH to um, remotely access the um, counters. And so we're here dealing with um, Legacy Horizon, as it became known. Correct. Not Horizon Online. And you would have been, I think, provided with this at, at the time, or seen it at the time, or had access to it at the time. We would have had access to it. Um, we, the SSC were generally on a um, standard distribution list to um, comment on documents and um, give um, feedback to documents, but they were um, rooted out amongst the team. Um, so I don't know if the dimensions, or if it was probably PVCS, I don't know if that contains the reviewers' comments to see who. Um, if we skip forwards... and then go down. Is that what you're referring to, the reviewer's um, details, i.e. those that were given the opportunity to review? That's correct, yes. And norm uh, um, so you've got mandatory, you've got um, Mick Peach, um, and he was just the figurehead for the document reviews, but they would be sent to the SSC and then given to And someone. then Mr Peach underneath him, I think. Yes. Oh, sorry, Mr Parker. Parker underneath, underneath him. him, yes. Thank you. And so this would have been a document that the SSE had the opportunity to review and comment on and then in its um, uh, final iteration distributed to the members of the SSE? No, it would have been put in dimensions storage. We may put it onto our SSE website. Some, um, if it, if it were, the final version was sent to us, this is the type of document we would put on the SSE website so it's searchable. So have members of the SSE would have access to it? Correct. Thank you. Um, can we just go to page nine, please, and look at the introduction to see what the document is? <coughs> um, under 1.1.1 general, um, SFS, I think that's security function specification. 
Would that be right? I, I, I don't know. If, if I'm right that that is what SFS means, yeah. security function uh, specification, what was the security function specification? I don't know. Um, anyway, it, assuming that it is what I say it is, uh, mandates the use of um, Tivoli remote console for the remote administration of data center platforms. Um, can you um, explain what, what that sentence is saying, please? Um, so Tivoli was a management uh, package that was used for eventing, among other things, and um, had ability to run some commands and Part of it was a remote console, um, which allows you to connect to a computer in a console, a command line um, facility, so you can execute commands on that computer. Thank you. Um, it continues, this records an auditable trail of logins to all boxes accessed by the user. I is that accurate to your knowledge? Um, I believe so. I <coughs> didn't manage to really. It says um, it is a matter of considerable discussion and correspondence that the Tivoli remote console is slow and difficult to administer. Do you remember that, i.e. that it was slow and difficult to administer? Not particularly. Okay. Uh, this has led over time to BOC personnel, BOC. Can you um, help us with that? what that was? No. Um, maybe Belfast Operations Centre? Could be. Um, if it is Belfast Operations Centre, what was the no, Belfast Operations Centre? They were the operations people. So, um, so part of Fujitsu in Belfast. Correct, yes. They looked after the, um, hard, the, the data centres. Relying heavily on the use of unauthorised tools, predominantly um, uh, our client. Uh, what was our client? That was a remote client, so that's a... <coughs> tool um, that you can use to get a command line interface onto um, a server for, uh, remotely. So that's what I remember we did use that to connect to the counters. You, you, and you used that as well, did you? We used that to connect to the counters. To, to, to connect to counters? Correct. Um, to remotely administer the live estate, um, its use is fundamental for the checking of errors. Would you agree with that sentence? Yes. Uh, the tool does not, however, record individual user um, access to system, but simply records events on the remote box that administrator access has been used. Um, was, does that reflect your understanding? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, you would probably have a Windows event that that user has been granted um, authorization to connect to the box, so a security event, I would imagine but it doesn't record um, what it, happened. It wouldn't recall, yeah. It, wouldn't it recall records the fact happened. of access, but not... Or even who ha who did it. It okay. would have been under a generic user. Okay, so it, it, it doesn't record what the purpose of the access was or what was done in the course of the access, and it doesn't record who has access. It, as you say, it would be a generic yes, record. Okay. Yeah. Um, no other information is provided, including success, fail, so it's not possible uh, to simply audit failures. The use of such techniques puts Pathway in contravention of contractual undertakings to the post office. Do you remember that um, issue arising uh, back when using Legacy Horizon? Um, not particularly. I do remember we used our client... Um, I don't particularly remember the Tivoli Remote Console, um, but I don't remember particularly using it. Um, and then do, you, do you remember a, an issue being raised as to the SSC's use of our client, putting it in breach of its contractual obligations or undertakings to the post office? I don't particularly remember that, but I do know that we did switch to using OpenSSH to connect. After proposals um, in this SOD, I'm afraid I, I couldn't find what that meant. SOD? Uh, that the system support, outline design, is that, that's what we are, this document, is it? I.e. this very document? Yeah. The system outline design, I've yeah. got it. So after proposals in this document have been implemented, a CP, can you help us with that? 
change proposal will be raised to phase out Tivoli Remote Console. Uh, console. Uh, this document provides an outline design which primarily stops pathway being in contravention of its contractual undertakings, but also provides an acceptable and agreed level of secure access to systems for support um, uh, access. Can you um, help us with what, if any, relationship the BOC, if I'm right, the Belfast Operations Centre, had to the SSC? So they looked after the data centre um, system, so the um, operating system of the um, the data centre servers, the um, databases in the database in the data centre. So if it wasn't written by Pathway, um, they generally looked after it. If it was written by Pathway, we looked after it. If that makes sense. Um, I think I understand. Can we go to page 13, paragraph 4.1.2, please? Let me just scroll down a little bit. Uh, I should read 4.1 first. Areas of concern. There are two major areas of concern with the current support processes. Second line support does not have the tools necessary to perform their function. Third line in operational support. <coughs> organizations access to the live system is not fully fully audited and in some cases is restricted in the actions that can be carried out the consequences of these two issues are specified in the following sections and then under 4.1.2 third line support staff receive repeated instances of calls that should have been filtered out by second line handling repeated calls um, is not an effective use of third line support resource the current support practices were developed on a needs-must basis. Third-line support diagnosticians had no alternative other than to adopt the approach taken, given the needs to um, support the deployed Horizon solution. The consequences of limited audit and system admin access afforded to third-line support staff provides the opportunity to, one, commit fraudulent acts, two, maliciously or inadvertently affect the stability of the new network banking and debit card online services. In addition, a complete audit would allow Pathway to defend the SSC against accusations or, uh, of fraud um, or misuse. Again, in um, 2002, did you know that this was an issue? I was unaware that this was an issue. Did you know that um, um, an investigation or a review was being undertaken into um, the extent of third line um, support access and the method um, that um, the SSC was using to procure such access and that it um, was said to have provided the opportunities set out there? Not particularly. I do remember we were talking I remember us talking about the open SSH access and I also remember it being um, told that it was going to be called every key press. So I knew that there was enhanced audit in the, what we were moving to. Um, but I, I don't remember particularly that it was um, a put to us in this way. Um, it was, yeah, it was enhanced audit. I did know that was coming in. Can you repeat that last sentence? I didn't hear it. It was enhanced auditing and uh, in this new method of access. I knew that was coming in. So um, you knew that a new method of access that was more auditable Correct. was being introduced. You didn't know the reasons that sat behind it. Yes. So, I mean, obviously I can infer something's coming in that's more auditable. The old one obviously was not auditable enough. Would you agree with what is said here as to the reasons for its introduction, namely that um, the uh, type of access that was afforded did give those opportunities? I don't know if I agree with the first one. Um, that it, it didn't give the uh, facility to staff to commit fraudulent acts? Yeah, so I, as far as I'm aware, the APS transactions and banking transactions are all digitally signed. Mm, so I can't see how 
SSC would be able to do any fraudulent activities there. Um, and the second one, maliciously or inadvertently. I imagine you, maliciously you could take, you could try and damage your database or take down an agent, which would cause an outage or a VPN server. So yes, I could see maliciously. Can we um, we can put that to one side? Can we look, please, um, at Fujitsu? Um, so, sorry, I'm so sorry. We should have um, looked at one other passage in that document. Um, 4.3.2 on page 15, please. Thank you. Um, the authors record that all support access <coughs> to the horizon systems is from physically secure uh, areas. Individuals involved in the support process undergo more frequent security vetting checks. Were those two things accurate? Yes. So the site was physically secure and there was uh, some enhanced vetting. Yes, so we had security checks on the staff. The site, the room on the sixth floor, had its own pass system. It wasn't part of the general building pass system. The, we had separate computers for connecting to the um, data center, um, as well as your corporate system. It was on a totally separate system. You had separate passwords. You had two-factor authentication with secure IDs. So yeah, it was fairly secure. And then um, it, it says, other than the above controls are vested in manual procedures, that doesn't make complete sense, um, requiring managerial sign-off, controlling access to post office counters where update of data is required. It's difficult to understand exactly what that means. It's probably talking about the OCPs, OCRs, and the, the MSCs and things we were talking about um, where there were other um, sign-offs, but that was a manual sign off to give you authorization but it didn't physically stop you doing it without that and there was no um, audit of it correct um, otherwise third line support has one unrestricted and unaudited privileged access to all systems including post office counter pcs that was true yes yes um, the ability to distribute diagnostic information outside of the secure environment this information can include personal data um, as defined by the Data Protection Act, business sensitive data and cryptographic key information. Uh, that was true as well. No. No. In, in which respects was it um, false? So we didn't support the KMA. We didn't support the key management. Um, we supported its interactions, but we didn't support it. That was where the key material was, I believe. Um, and we didn't support the audit server either, so we um, didn't have access to those. Um, we had there was a separate key um, server which was in a little room. It was locked and used by the security people. There was a KMA workstation, which we was used by a fourth line support person who did the support for the key management. Um, so there were areas we didn't support. All right, so it's a, um, an accurate statement but needs to be qualified in that there are some areas that um, it does not apply to. Yes, way of describing I was it. specifically, I'm thinking about the cryptographic <clears throat> key information. Um, skipping a paragraph which is a repetition largely of what appeared Previously, um, the authors record there are no automatic controls in place to audit and restrict user access. This exposes Fujitsu to the following potential risks. Opportunity for financial fraud. Would you agree with that? No. I see how you could do financial fraud. Um, operational risk, errors as a result of manual actions causing loss of service to outlets. Yes. You agree with that? Yeah. And infringements of the Data Protection Act? Yes. You'd agree with that. Thank you. Now, th this um, process that's um, being described, i.e. the backward look, and the, um, the fixes 
that were proposed, you ha didn't include any of that in your um, email of the of May 2014. No. Um, is that because you were answering the narrow question that was asked of you? There were literally two questions, and I answered them both. Can we look um, at um, uh, Fujitsu Triple Zero H nine seven five six? This also is. This is this legacy. Is legacy, and yeah. the questions were. In they don't say Horizon Online, but they could only apply to Horizon Online. Exactly. Uh, can we look, please, at... Um, yes, thank you, we've got it up. This is um, a peak. Um, uh, peak number 0208119. You'll see, um, if we just scroll down a little bit, please, and a bit more that it's opened in February 2011. Yep. I think you were aware of this uh, peak because it um, related to your work, and at one stage I think it was referred to you and you made a contribution to it. Um, I think we can just see that um, if we go forward to page three. And just scroll down. I think we can see a, an entry on there of the 17th of August 2011 by you. Yes? Yes, yeah, so this is about the app sub. Yes, so if we just go back to the beginning then, please, page one. And the summary of the incident we can see is that SSC database users do not have correct permissions. Uh, can you see um, whether this was raised by somebody within Fujitsu or... Um, yeah, it's log, call logger top right by Mark Wright in the EDSC. And then if we um, scroll down to the impact statement, <coughs> um, SSC users affected have more access... <coughs> than is required to database resources. This is contrary to security policy. Uh, there, is no, there is currently no cost to this issue. As for perceived impact, the customer is not aware of this problem or change scope. No actual impact stroke incidents or problems relating to this issue have been experienced yet and not um, expected. Then if we can go down, please. Um, to what Mr. Wright wrote when opening um, the peak. Summary, which we've seen above, um, database users do not have correct permissions. And then in more detail, um, and we're dealing with Horizon Online here, aren't we? Yes, we are. Uh, development have delivered scripts to allow SSC users to perform certain tidy up tasks like clear failed recoveries. However, they have been delivered to work against an SSC role which SSC users have not been granted as SSC users have the app SUP role. Can you explain what that first paragraph means, please? So these are roles in the database that grant different permissions. So the SSC role is a read-only role. So that's our default role. Um, the apps up role is the one we were talking about before, which does have the update permissions. Um, either um, SSC user creation configuration needs to be amended to make sure we all, uh, sorry, we have all required permissions um, of, uh, and then I think that's meant to mean or, or the scripts will need amending to match how our users are set up in live. Yes. And again, can you um, decode that for us, please? So the scripts um, are obviously using a different permission that does no longer work. Um, and either the SSC profile user on the database has to be updated or the scripts have to be updated so they work. And then if we um, scroll down, please. 
um, he, that's Mr. Wright, I think, includes an email chain that's included. If we scroll down a little further. Thank you. I think we can see an email um, from Ann Chambers of the 1st of February 2011 that's been cut into this peak. Can you see that? Yes. And um, she says, unfortunately, development write their scripts explicitly to use SSC. So I think we're stuck with it unless they deliver new scripts, which would not be a popular or quick option. When we go off piste, we use apps up. Can we have both? Firstly, um, can you um, help explain what the first paragraph of Ms. Chambers' uh, email is referring to? So that I think that's talking about the scripts that Mark was detailing above, like the um, failed recovery tidy script, um, that they write them to use the SSC profile, which now no longer has write permission. And then um, she says, when we go off piste, we use apps up. What does that mean? So, like we were just talking about the script, that script is written to, it's a known issue about clearing a failed recovery once they've been investigated. Um, off piece, she's re basically saying that there is no tool to do this. This is something we've not come across before. Um, therefore, you could wait and write a tool to do the correction, or we have to go in manually to do the correction. And we use apps up to do that. Apps up is the right role, the, the role with the update permissions. Uh, do, what, what do you understand the reference to going off piece to mean? Where there is a new issue that you haven't got a script to fix already. Um, Mr um, Gibson um, replies, I suspect you can have both, but either way, you need a development fix as they produce the user creation script, which does the database bit. If they have to produce a fix, I'd advise making one of the roles suitable rather than having a mix of grants across both roles. And then scroll up, please. Uh, Mr. Wright replies, I thought the original issue was why have the SSC users not had the SSC role granted? Um, if it is a bug in the creation scripts, then yes, needs development to fix. But I thought something was said the other day about the SSC users not being uh, correctly uh, set up at the start. And what's he referring to there? Um, so I think this is about the SSC users not having the permissions to switch to the database roles. But um, so that they couldn't run the, the script should automatically switch to whatever role it needs to do in the script. Um, and it wasn't. Um, then he's saying, are the SSC users set up correctly? Are, is the permissions correct for the SSC user? And then if we go forward a page to your contribution. Uh, scroll down, please. Um, six months on, uh, you say, this is getting confused. This incident is about the SSC role, which ISD, ISD being? They're the operations people need to give to the SSC in order to run a script provided to the SSC by development. And then underneath that, it seems you um, transferred the call to a different team, is that right? Yeah, there's the host, APOP host dev, so um, APOP is a database development team. And why was it necessary to transfer? Um, I think it was because we needed an answer about um, the database roles and what they should be set as. Um, I'm not going to carry on um, through the um, email, save to go, uh, sorry, through the peak to go, save to go to the last page, please. Thank you. Um, and we see Mr. Haywood, and we're sort of a year and three months on from the start. Um, he, um, who was Mr. Hayward? Um, security manager, so, yeah. Uh, the business impact has been updated. 
SSC users um, affected have more access than is required to database resources, which is contrary to security policy. And then we see him um, including there the impact statement that we read um, originally. Can you remember what the solution was to this? Um, this is, I mentioned before, where we don't have any default access to up, um, right permissions. I think this is the outcome from this. So we have to ask um, SecOps to ask ISD, the operations people, to grant that permission for a temporary pr process Why we do the off-piste things. So I think that was the output of this. So and when was that um, solution put in to your uh, memory? Uh, after this. So sometime after um, June 15? Yes. So does it follow that the between the rollout of Horizon Online in, say, 2010 until mid-2015, there was off-piste access by the SSC? There was. It, was, it still wasn't the default role. So the default role is read-only, but you could, without going through SecOps and ISD, do set role apps up to be granted the update permission. And how frequently was that done? Not very frequently, to my knowledge. But again, you could go through the pinnacles to um, peaks to find out at that time. And was it... Um, Sorry, um, OCPs and OCRs as well would have been. Was it um, other than by looking at peaks where somebody had recorded that they had done this, auditable? I believe so. I believe there was an audit. How, how was it auditable? You, again, I didn't support audit, but I believe um, that it wrote a message saying that you had switched role. So you believe that you, you personally wrote a message? No, so no, sorry. The, the, system, the system wrote a message. system writes a message to audit saying that this user has switched role to apps up. I believe, again, that I think I saw a list of that in the GLO. Was that via a tweet or... No, no. Or, or actually seeing the I evidence? Think it was, I think I saw the evidence of a list of the times that they switched into it. Was it known within the SSC community that this um, going off piste using apps up was problematic? Um, I, we didn't know it was against any rules that um, Mr. Hayward knew, um, but um, going off piste, as it was put, um, would definitely require a OCR or OCP to be raised and signed off by SSC manager for OCRs and others for OCPs. That requires the person that's going off piece to um, tell somebody else that they're doing it. And yes. That puts the onus on the individual. Yes, there was procedures in place and Mick was very sure about his procedures and we had two sets of eyes procedures as well for doing such things. If that was the case, that there were procedures in place that included two sets of eyes on it. Do you know why a change was necessary? I would say to make doubly sure that we couldn't do it. It's, it's another step. There is an idea of steps of separation where you, you could, like another team, can't do certain things. We can't access audit. We can't access um, the KMA. Um, and that's a security bit put in, and this is another one of those. And again, in your May 14 email, um, why would you not tell those that were asking about this? I was literally asked two questions, and I literally replied to those two questions. So if you've been asked the question, look, we're looking at the extent to which the SSC can do things to data without there being a proper security control mechanism in place or uh, um, an automatically generated audit trail of them. Can you tell us about any of those things, please? You may have mentioned what we're talking about now. And I would also probably refer them to the audit architect because we don't support audit, so I couldn't really tell you that much about what does get written to audit, where it gets written. No, but what you could say is that we, um, we've spent by then 
four years going off piste? <laughs> I could say that for four years we've had the access to um, switch roll to apps up and these are the, probably the times we've done it based on the peaks and OCPs, OCRs. And of course when you were making your... Um, your contribution to this chain that was in August 2011 yes. to this to this peak. To this, yeah. Um, did you then drop out of the peak thereafter? I think I routed it off to a different team at that stage. And so you weren't aware of necessarily what happened in the administration of the <coughs> excuse me of the peak thereafter. Not particularly. I would have known that there was a procedural change when it was changed, and this is the new process we got to follow to get access to apps up. But um, back to the May 14 email, it was the narrowness of the questions that you were asked that were caused the narrowness of the questions. answer. It was, it was exactly that. Um, can we um, turn lastly to some EPOS faults, please? Um, can we look, please, at... Um, uh, FUJ 3003 um, I think um, you raised this. Yes. Pinnacle, is that right? That's correct. And would that have originated from uh, Sub Postmaster Call? No. Where would it have originated from? Um, Where did it originate from? It originated inside the SSC. Um, and how? I don't know how I found that there were no moulds in APS and EPS transactions, sorry, EPOS transactions, but that is the key. To how, how did you know to connect the problem with EPOS? Um, so, they we're talking about different transaction types. So they are um, APS transactions go into the APS database. They are a type of transaction. So like bill payments, that's an APS transaction. EPOS transactions are a different type, like, like um, transacting the stamp or, um, for example, yeah. So they are two different types of transactions and where they go. Can we look, please, at Fujitsu 3058190? And can we look at page 8 of this document, please? Hmm. I think that's a rogue reference. Um, FUJ 3058190. Yes, that's my fault. <laughs> I'll ask the questions without the, the documentary sure. um, uh, reference. The EPOS fault that you raised, um, were you aware at that time that there was um, a serious... Um, instability issue with EPOS? Um, only from what the peaks we were getting in, I would say, um, what instability... In well, were you aware that um, it, it was proposed that uh, there should be a rewrite of the code, or at least the code so far as it related to the cash count? No, I wasn't aware at that time. Do you remember any discussions within um, Fujitsu about the need to rewrite the EPOS code so far as it related to the cash account? No, I wasn't aware. Yes, thank you very much, Mr Simpkins. So are there any questions I ask for the moment? Um, I believe that Mr Steen is shaking his head. Um, 
So I wonder whether we might break um, for a couple of minutes. Miss um, Page wanted to raise an issue with me. And, yeah, uh, by all means. Um, I'll stay close by, so just um, alert me and I'll come back on screen, OK? Yes, thank you. So can you see and hear me? Yes. Uh, thank, yeah. you, thank you very much. Uh, Mr Simpkins is just being shown uh, back into the room. Sorry, would you repeat that, Mr? Yes, Mr. Simpkins is just being shown back into the room. He's taking right. his seat now, and we're ready to go with uh, with Ms. Page first. Thank you. Mr. Simpkins, hello. I'm Flora Page. I represent a number of the sub-postmasters, uh, and indeed um, some of them were uh, uh, prosecuted, as you probably know, and some of them were sent to prison. And so what I'm going to ask about is uh, a few different areas of how your role might have affected them. And uh, I'm going to start, if I may, with the third supplemental agreement. Now, that may not mean much to you. Have you heard of that? No, I think I may have had a, a supplemental agreement in here, but I think maybe in the fourth. I'm not sure. So it was just to give you a little context of, of chronology... It was uh, signed in January of 2000, so relatively early in the national rollout. Mm -hmm. You were working then, weren't you, in the yes. SSC? Uh, one of the issues that is clear from that third supplemental agreement is that the, uh, the technical people in Fujitsu, and indeed, as a result of that agreement, it's clear that post office also knew that there would be cash account errors caused by reference data, uh, also caused by other technical faults, and that in some cases they anticipated that they would only be picked up by sub-postmasters phoning the call centre. Is, is that something that, that uh, you can sort of accept from me in terms I can, I can of interpretation so. of the agreement? All right. Well... Were you and your team ever alerted to that? Um, if they, we would take the calls, sorry, so they would contact either MBSC or HSH, and then if it was HSH, it would, if it was a software issue, hopefully find its way to us. Um, and then we would investigate them based on that. Um, but I don't know about the agreement. Well... Obviously, you'd be alerted if a sub-postmaster came to you yes. through the lower lines of support, and you would know that you were speaking to a sub-postmaster. But my question was, did anyone at Fujitsu, in your management structure or, or in any fashion, let you know and your team know that there would be or there could be faults which would only become apparent because a sub-postmaster alerted the help desk to that, and that might come to you in, in through up through the chain. Um, not particularly. I can't recall being told that there would be faults that only a sub postmaster may notice. But we did identify faults based off calls from sub postmasters, so it was definitely a thing we did. And we did identify faults based on the call, those calls. Um, if we identified a fault, we would scope the fault. And um, once it was recognised and identify who was affected by that. Um, so I think I'm saying the team knew that there were issues that type postmasters were identifying that weren't being picked up by automated things in the data centre. All right. Well, in that case, um, can we please look at document number poll triple zero two eight seven four three? And when it comes up, you'll see that it's a peak from two thousand and one. It's sometimes quite hard to read these uh, these peaks. Um, if we perhaps. Can you read it? Are you able to? I can read that. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I think this was in my pack as well. It, it will have been. Um, 
if we look in closely at 1258, uh, on the 14th of uh, April, it says the uh, PM, I presume they're meaning postmaster, extremely unhappy about the problem with his counters. He says he has had to pay out over 1,500 in losses that are due to these problems. He has informed Pockle they can suspend him because he is refusing to make good any further losses. Uh, he asks for a face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, he feels very strongly about this. He says he's willing to take Pockle to a tribunal stroke court because of the stress he has suffered because of the problems. Um, and then it uh, says a bit further down in capitals, the call is only to be closed with the express permission of Julian Hall. Um, do you know who Julian Hall is? I don't. This was entered from the Horizon System help desk. This is their text before it gets to SSC. I see. Uh, if we go on a bit further... Uh, if we go as far as page four, please. And um, about halfway down, we can see that this is an update from yesterday's call. This is in capitals, made by the PM. Um, Power help servers down. Call was taken over by STSA Donna Moulds, and the following information was manually logged. PM would like to add to the current complaint that transactions are currently appearing and disappearing on screen, and also the PM's counter printer has not been working either. PM had a message on screen stating about the transaction, then the screen froze and timed out. When logged back in, the transaction was not on screen. PM rebooted the printer, receipt for the transaction was printed, now the printer won't print any receipts, etc. PM, a bit further down, it says at 9.33, PM would like to add that on the 18th of April, the PM spoke to Gareth from the environment, rent, environmental team. Gareth advised the PM that he will be in touch with him before the end of the month to investigate any problems. It is now past the end, end of the month and still nothing has been done. Uh, if we carry on down a bit, please. Uh, PM, this is at um, 9.35. PM feels the system is unreliable. PM cannot trust this system. Uh, he says again that he wants to speak to someone face to face. Uh, it's quite clear as far as this postmaster is concerned that he is saying that this is not his fault. He has not done anything wrong. The system is unreliable. Yes? Yes, this, this was a phantom transactions call, wasn't it? It was. That's, that's quite right. And, uh, and indeed, if we go down to page 10, we can see that reference to phantom transactions. Uh, I think a little higher... Well, while we're here, we can see that it's closed down um, on the basis that I'm therefore closing this call as it's no fault in product. Um, and a bit higher up, we can see uh, under 12, 12th of November 2001, Patrick Carroll, in all cases, uh, sorry, phantom transactions have not been proven in circumstances which preclude user error in all cases where these have occurred, a user error related cause can be attributed to the phenomenon. I'm therefore closing this call as no fault in product. But if we, if we look further up, and, and in fact, I mean, you may be able to confirm it for us without us looking further up, the uh, phantom transactions that the user is referring to were in fact witnessed, weren't they? Yeah, by, by a Romec engineer. A Romec engineer, exactly. Um, and yet this, uh, this later entry says, well, we'll just close this down. There's no fault. It must be user error. Yeah, I did read through it. I don't remember Pat 
Carol researching this one. I know he did do a lot of monitoring and things like that. That's all in the call. Um, and I don't know if this comment is after for after those um, those were put in place. But um, yeah, I agree. It doesn't read well, but I can't comment on what was the conclusion. What I'm I'm getting at here is. Um, if you had known, if you had been told explicitly and clearly that there would be errors which could only be picked up by sub-postmasters making calls and saying that they're experiencing, let's say, phantom transactions or whatever it may be, yeah. um, do you think you <coughs> and your team would have been as willing to close down calls on the basis that it must be user error? I don't know how many calls we closed down in user error without good proof. Um, again, that probably can <coughs> be researched through the pinnacles and peaks. Um, and this one was investigated extremely heavily with multiple changes made, monitoring put in. But I cannot, I agree, I cannot com comment on the closure of that. Well, when you say you can't comment on it, what do you mean by I that? I don't know what investigation Pat had concluded to make that decision. Was there a tendency to uh, ascribe user error if a uh, fault could not be got to the bottom of, as it were? Um, I've heard that mentioned before um, I, by Mr. Roll, I think, and I would hope not. <coughs> um, I don't think there was. Um, again, a retrospective review of the peaks and pinnacles might be able to clarify that. Um, thank you. Could we perhaps look at another uh, pinnacle, or a pinnacle rather than a peak? This one is FUJ 0004288. Uh, and um, <coughs> this one begins on the 25th of February of 2000. Um, if we go down, please, to uh, the 1st of March of 2000. And if we look at 11.51, we see here, don't we, um, that uh, at 11.51, your uh, Steve Warwick, is he, he's one of your colleagues, is that right? You're there at the top. He was a full-flying support. Um, he was a... Full-flying support. Um, Fourth-flying support, I yeah. see. So does that suggest that you and your colleagues have then brought him in? Yes. So <coughs> if you look at the full-flying, it says, please route to EPOS dev. Right. And so um, he's EPOS dev. Yes. And he says uh, at 11.51, um, this is identical to an issue which was raised approximately four months ago, the cause of which was never found. Um, do you know what happened when a cause was never found, as it were? Who was informed? Were you ever informed? Was your team ever given a sort of a message from fourth line support that said, there's been no, there's been no solution to this one, We're, it's outstanding? We, um, I don't know if we have that for this one, but we definitely were, we raised Kells, which said a description of the, um, the problem and what we've looked at, and they were used in order in case it um, was raised again. Um, I think th that there was another call later on which he said a um, similar issue was caused by archiving in repost happening at the same time as doing um, the cash count. Um, 
if we go down to page 13, uh, it comes back to you. Can you explain to us how it comes back to you? Um, so Martin's rooted it back to the EDSC <coughs> and Diane's passed it to me and I've passed it to the management support unit. So I think it was raised by the management support unit from the automated um, host detection. So the Perhaps if you can just explain. So does that mean when you say the automated host detection, what, so, what is that? So on the TPS database, it automatically checked things like cash accounts. And this was picked up, this pinnacle was raised on the back of some of those alerts. I see. Um, so we are passing it back, the information on the uh, pinnacle, back to the team who raised the call. I point. see. And so when it says... Um, a bit further down, Pockle have now agreed closure of this incident. Um, that's because this is something that's arisen on a on a platform, and the and therefore the the customer support people are actually liaising with Pockle about it. Yes. And and Pockle have agreed to close this down. Yes. So um, the MSU, the or BSU at that time, um, they would. Um, for this, send con corrected cash accounts to Pockle. So this is um, what, the, what their process was. And then... So this would definitely have involved amending cash accounts? It was um, involved in reporting the corrected cash accounts, not touching the system at all in any way. But, but explaining that there Explaining are what the, um, why the cash accounts that would have been sent automatically work incorrect. Um, when you say explaining, um, we can look at it if you like, but if from your memory having read it, it, it does make it pretty clear, doesn't it, that the problem is pretty intractable. This, this, uh, this, this, does, it does, this doesn't appear to have resolved the problem does Correct. It, on a root cause basis. Yes. So, um, and indeed, it ov it's obviously involving repost, it's involving the data server, it's a pretty um, deep problem, if I can put it that way. Yes. And this uh, record does not show it having been resolved. Correct. But at the end of it, through the customer support team liaising with Pockle, they've at least resolved the cash accounts, if not the problem. Correct. And you presumably have no idea what was then decided in terms of how cash accounts were going to be looked at or handled or dealt with going forward? No, I believe the management support unit would send a corrected cash account in these instances. For the ones that had been found? For the, yes, and so this was picked up on the automated um, checks. Yes, I see. It's fair to say, isn't it, that, that, that cash account discrepancies came up a lot in, in what you were dealing with, didn't they, at that time? They did. Um, was there any forum for collating those and putting them together and saying, here's a lot of cash account problems, um, can we spot any, any patterns here? Um, one of the documents I had um, was um, had all the issues that had been fixed or listed them all um, as, and which were new ones um, to, that affected the cash accounts. Um, I presume it was something to do with the AI. Um, I cover flick through, but it um, had a table at the back, and it seemed to indicate all the ones that um, and how they were being detected. But that wasn't your document. That wasn't a document no. produced by SSC. No. All right. Thank you. Uh, those are my questions. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Uh, Miss Patrick here for um, yeah. Agile CPs. Um, 
Good morning, Mr Simpkins. Uh, my name's Angela Patrick, and I ask questions for another number of uh, sub-postmasters who were wrongly convicted, and I'm instructed by Hudjo solicitors. Um, You'll be glad to know I only have two topics to ask you about, um, and it's about uh, issues that arose in the management of bugs, errors and defects. Uh, and the first document I'd like us to take a look at is FUJ 3081584. And you see there's a table at the top there. It looks like it's a note of a meeting. Uh, and I think you can see there you're an attendee there. Yes. Sorted. Uh, and your name's a few from the bottom. And right below yours is Gareth Jenkins. Can you yes. see that? I can. And we think this is a table you can see at the top. It's about a receipts and payments mismatch issue. Uh, and the inquiry's heard something about that and will hear something more. I think that was an issue that was discovered in mid-2010. Yes, is that it correct? Was, yeah, newly into the HNGX. Yes, newly into the development of Horizon Online. Is that yes, fair? That's fair. The only reason I raise that is there's no date on the document. No, that's fair. And if we can go to page three, please, at the very top of the page, uh, and we can see there uh, there's an explanation about uh, the receipts and payments mismatch will result in an error code being generated, which will allow Fujitsu to... And it, there's a bit more explanation... But what I want to look at at the bottom is um, oh, uh, of that paragraph. We have asked Fujitsu why it has taken so long to react to and escalate an issue which began in May. They will provide feedback in due course. Um, so you said the bug was discovered in the period running up to the development of Horizon Online. Was this actually in the period which was running up to the acceptance of Horizon Online? I don't know. Okay. We can perhaps ask another witness. Um, do you know why there was a delay in informing the post office <coughs> about this bug? No, I don't know. Are you able to help us on where the feedback that's mentioned there that was going to be provided to the post office could be found? Mm, not to my knowledge, unless it was a, the list of the affected branches. I believe that there was a list produced and, um, and monitored for further occurrences, but I couldn't... I think my reading of that is Fujitsu, we've asked Fujitsu why it's taken so long to react to <coughs> and escalate an issue which began in May. They'll provide feedback in due course. Do you know if there was any feedback given to the post office about why there was such a long delay I in don't. informing them about the bug? No, I don't. Thank you. And this receipts and payments mismatch bug... Are you able to help us with your explanation, perhaps a simple explanation, of what it was? So I have read a little bit up on it. Um, so it was when you were doing your stock unit balance and if you had a discrepancy, it comes up with a message to warn you and say whether you want to post it to a local suspense. If you, at that point, hit the cancel on the message you could then hit print and carry on forward. It doesn't rewarn you, and it lost that discrepancy value. So it produces a cash account, I'm sorry, a, a stock unit rollover that was out of balance, so payments didn't match receipts. It was visible on the tally roll, but it didn't warn the postmaster again. Then if they went to do the branch trading statement, um, when they roll the branch trading statement, they would uh, get a non-zero trading position warning message because of that stock unit had our uh, payments and receipts mismatch. So it was, it was really short. It showed an imbalance in the cash account, ultimately, didn't it? In, it showed an imbalance in the uh, branch trading statement, yes. Thank you. 
Now, if we can turn to page two, please, we can see at the bottom of page two where the impact of this was analysed. Um, and I'm going to look at the last three of those bullets. Impact. If widely known, this could cause a loss of confidence in the horizon system by branches. Potential impact upon ongoing legal cases where branches are disputing the integrity of horizon data. And then finally, it could provide branches ammunition to blame horizon for future discrepancies. And you can see that there on the record. I can. Uh, so that's discussing that the impact wasn't simply on the inability of sub-postmasters to reach a balance, but there could be a wider impact because of the understanding of this problem being a system problem. Yeah. Is that fair? I think that's fair. Uh, and can we look at page three, please, at the bottom? We have, I think here, if I'm correct in my pagination, <coughs> a list of possible solutions, is that right? Yes. Uh, and there's one, two, and three. Uh, and if we look at solution two, the, uh, there's a, a, a number of suggestions there. The PNBA will journal values from the discrepancy account into the customer account and re recover or refund via normal processes. This will need to be supported by an approved poll communication, unlike the branch poll sat remains in balance, albeit with an account discrepancy that should be cleared. Um, I think that the recommendation you can see there is that that solution, solution two, should be progressed. Is that right? At the top, under proposal for affected branches. Yeah, the group's recommendation is solution two should be progressed. Are you able to help us as to whether what happened was solution two adopted? I'm not able to help you, um, but I'm sure it should be relatively straightforward to find out. Okay. Can we scroll to the top of that page, page three? You can see um, there's a, an a introduction or a sort of overview uh, explained there. Uh, paragraph two, Fujitsu are writing a code fix to which, and I think there's a will missing there, which will stop the discrepancy disappearing from Horizon in the future. They're aiming to deliver this into test week, commencing 4th October, with live proving at the model office week, commencing 11th October, with full rollout to the network completed by 21st October. We've explored moving this forward, and this is the earliest it can be released into live. So the problem was discovered in May, it's, it's brought to the attention of the post office, I think, in September. Um, uh, and now it's, it, the solution will not be actioned until, or live until October. Is that correct? That sounds correct, yeah. And then it goes on. The code fix will, 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 and I think there's another typo here, the code fix will on-stop the issue occurring in the future, but it will not fix any current mismatch at branch. Can you help us with what that would mean in practice? So if you've already got a payments receipts mismatch in a stock unit and uh, a non-zero branch train statement, this fix won't correct that, but it will stop it happening in the future. Um, so there would be a problem that wouldn't be fixed by the fix. Does that mean that something else would need to be done? The solution one, the two, or... Sorry. Apologies. Would something else need to be done to fix the mismatch that had already be happened? Um, you don't have to do anything um, apart from it, you, the it, um, imbalance would roll over, be brought forward, and then be reported in the next um, branch training statement, and after that it would be cleared. So you don't actually have to do anything as long as... Um, the post office is made aware of what has happened. As long as the post office is aware that it's happened. Correct. 
and they're aware which branches may Correct. have been affected. Correct. Okay. Thank you. I think we can move to the second document I'd like to look at, Mr. Simpson. <coughs> it's FUJ 3083770. And that's, it's a series of emails. Can you see that in front of you now? Yes. Um, and you can see, if we scroll to the very bottom, which I'm going to start with, um, where you can see your name mentioned first, um, you can see there at the very bottom there was an email sent from Mike Stewart to you on the 22nd of February 2006. Can you see that? Yes. And I'm not going to look at that yet. I'm going to scroll a little bit to the bottom so we can all see what the issue was. Can we go to page six, please, at the bottom? Uh, a little further down, thank you. Uh, and you see there's an email there um, from Sean... To, uh, it's Sean, It's from Sandra Mackay to Sean Turner. Uh, are you able to help us with who they were? Mm, no. I think it, her title is there. Somebody else might be able to help us. Sandra Mackay, it says, is from Sales and Service. And it says, you recall in September the above office had major problems with the Horizon system relating to transfers between stock units. And we'll say the postmaster has reported that he is again experiencing problems with transfers, which resulted in a loss of around £43,000, uh, so which has subsequently rectified itself. I know that the postmaster has reported this to Horizon Support, who have come back to him stating they cannot find any problem. Clearly, the postmaster is concerned, as we've just spent a number of months trying to sort out the first instance and he doesn't want a repeat performance. He's convinced that there is something wrong with his Horizon kit. I'd be grateful if you could investigate this and give him any support that you can. And, it's, uh, and if we scroll back up a little bit, we will see the reply or a further email in the chain at the top of page six. Um, I think it's a further e email in the chain rather than a reply. It's from Sean, uh, Brian... Trotter uh, to Sean Turner uh, and do you know who Brian Trotter was? No. So uh, it says further to Sandra's email I visited the branch with Sandra last week and the postmaster provided clear documented evidence that something very wrong is occurring with some of the processes when carrying out transfers between stock units. To be absolutely sure from our side can we either carry out a thorough check of the alleged faulty processes or swap them out? Um, so we, here, from what we can see, at this end of the problem, it's a postmaster who has had an issue which has come back again and is being investigated. And somebody has also again witnessed that there is indeed an issue. Is okay. that fair? That's fair. Okay, if we can go back to page one, please. And if we start at the bottom uh, with the email that Mike Stewart sent to you. If we scroll a little bit further down, please. We see that Mike Stewart's writing to you. John, did you get a chance to look at this? Uh, do we think all will be well after the section it's S90 counter rollout? Was the S90 a new release yes. for Horizon Legacy? Yes. Thank you. Uh, and if you go down, we can see, I won't read it out all, you can see he's tried in the first instance to reach Anne Chambers, but she was away, is that right? I presume so. Yeah, you can see, it says, Anne's away, can I have your comments, as you were involved as well. And he goes on to talk about the pinnacle, uh, and he refers to there being a pinnacle for this issue, and it says, the timeout events are apparently fixed in a new repost version released at S90, and there's a pinnacle number. And it says, I've looked at the problems and can't see why the system reported disconnected nodes. And it goes on a little bit. Uh, and he explains, I think the best thing now is to see what happens after S90. I'll continue to keep this call open to remind me that this site should be checked then. 
uh, and it goes on a little bit to talk about uh, the postmaster um, or the person reporting the problem initially being reported as female, uh, and it goes on again to say a little bit more about the problem. He refers to a magical £43,000 appearing and disappearing, and the postmaster is then reported to be male. Uh, and he says, September, the above office had major problems with the Horizon system relating to transfers between stock units. The postmaster has reported that he is again experiencing problems with transfers, and it says, which resulted in £43,000, which has subsequently rectified itself. I know that he's reported this to Horizon support, and they've come back to him stating they can't find a problem. And it repeats that almost the content of the email we've, we've just discussed. And he goes on, he says, sorry for his long-windedness. Is it a problem at the branch, he wants to query? Is it the Horizon kit, or is there an issue with the staff there? If there is an issue, is this S90 release the cure? And then he asks, how confident are you, or we, that it will fix the problem? And then he says the release is due in the week of the 4th of March. So we're in February at this point. He's talking about a few weeks away. Is that fair? Yeah. Uh, so he's, he's, he's posing some questions for you, originally for Anne Chambers, to consider. Is that right? Yes. And if we scroll up on page one, we'll see the reply doesn't come from you. It comes from Anne Chambers. And it says, I believe John has already responded to this, so I don't know if you need any more from me. Perhaps suggests that she's spoken to you before she's replied, doesn't it? That seems reasonable. Yeah. And it says, I haven't looked at the recent evidence, but I know in the past this site has hit this repost lock problem two or three times within a few weeks. This problem has been around for years and affects a number of sites most weeks. And finally, Escher say that they have done something about it. I'm interested in whether they have really fixed it, which is why I left the call open, to remind me to check over the whole estate once S90 is alive. Call me cynical but I do not just accept a third party's word that they have fixed something. What I never got to the bottom of, and she explains she's concerned why this particular branch had a particular problem. Uh, and it goes on to say, Kells tell SMC they must contact sites and warn them of balancing problems if they notice the event storms caused by Heldlock and advise them to reboot before continuing with the balance. And it says, unfortunately, in practice, it seems to take SMC several hours to notice these storms, by which time the damage may have been done. So it's a problem there that we know has already been known about for years. Is that right? The locking problem, yes. Uh, and there's no solution as yet. They're looking to S90. Is that correct? Yes. So <coughs> the locking problem stops counters communicating between each other. So it's like having what we were talking before about um, replication not happening. Um, and the, what had happened is with the counter square, they did a transfer out. They did the transfer in on one counter and then they could do the transfer in on another counter because it hadn't got the transfer in messages replicated to it so they had two transfer ins and one transfer out so you had a payments and receipts mismatch so again a mismatch correct uh, and she says Anne, that they still need to check the whole estate so after s90 goes live that's looking for these events and there's still a need to investigate further, isn't there? Yes, so once the software's been rolled out, then you would check to ensure it has fixed the problem. But she expresses the problem that with this issue, it can sometimes take several hours to detect the problem, 
and by that point the damage has been done. That was the workaround until the fix is put in place. So the workaround was at SMC monitor the events from the estate and the lock event, when they see the lock event, they contact the branch to reboot that counter, which um, was the workaround to fix the locking problem so that then it will be replicating to the neighbouring counters. And if we go back to the, the email chain, the very last in the thread, uh, we see uh, a message from Mike Stewart to Anne Chambers. It says, Anne, John did reply, but just to say that Escher say they have fixed it. So like you, we'll have to wait and see what happens after the S90 rollout. Uh, and again, what we've got there, there's no solution as yet. Everybody's going to wait and see for S90. Is that fair? That's fair. The workaround is in place, but it is fair. Uh, and it's, again, the issue is that ESHA say they have fixed it. Yes. There's no certainty at this point, is there? Uh, no, I think the third line support team are a cynical lot. Indeed. Um, were Fujitsu here <coughs> reliant on ESHA or ESHA for a solution? For a fix to repost, this is a repost bug with the, the repost lock-in so it wouldn't replicate. So for a repost bug, yes. it needs an Escher fix. Escher write the repost software, yes, that's correct. You weren't fixing it on site, it had to be repaired by Escher. That's correct, it's a software. Uh, the new version of repost fixed that problem. Thank you. I don't think I have any further questions for you, Mr. Duncan. Sir, and I don't think there are any other questions um, from anyone. So that's obviously a convenient time to break for lunch. Um, Mr. Simpkins, thank you very much for providing your written statement and for answering questions during the course of the morning. I'm grateful. Thank you. So, so before we break, um, there's a possibility that um, Mr. Simpkins will uh, come back to help us further in the inquiry in later phases. I've been asked by the Fujitsu legal team whether they have permission to speak with him um, in the intervening period. Well, my um, short answer to that is yes. Yes, thank you very much, sir. So um, did you say two o'clock? Well, five past, I think. Uh, oh, did you? <laughs> thank you very much, sir.